The love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Good morning and welcome to the United Church of Santa Fe on the joyous Sunday of Lent, March 22nd, 2020. I'm joined today by our music director, Jacqueline Helene, who is at the piano. Katie Bickley is our sound technician. And you might see lying on the floor next to my left is Najoni, who is the church dog. She, um, this is not her usual place, but then we are not in usual times. It's good to have you joining us for worship whenever you happen to be listening to this. We also invite you to follow along on the bulletin that we have, where you are, we are sending with this video as well. As we begin our time together, now I welcome you to the United Church of Santa Fe and also to this service. I'd like to invite you to turn off your cell phone if you happen to have one with you, where, whether you are at home or anyplace else, so that this time together can be a time that is truly devoted to being in God's presence. And also please know that we keep you and your family and loved ones in our prayers this day and throughout this time ahead, as well as keeping this whole world in those prayers as well. And now I'd like to invite us to begin worship as we do every Sunday here at the United Church of Santa Fe, which is by taking time to take into our lives God's gifts. So let us breathe in deeply the gift of God's peace. Let us breathe in deeply the gift of God's hope. And let us breathe in God's deep abiding love. Let us gather, my friends, wherever we are, to worship God and to continue this journey of Lent.
Please join me in the call to worship. We are gathered in the presence of God, our Creator, who sets before us the ways of life and death. We are gathered in the presence of Jesus the Christ, who calls us to accept the cost of discipleship that we may know its joy. We are gathered in the presence of the Spirit, who sustains us in trial and rejoicing. In our living and in our dying, we belong to God. In the shadow of God's wings, we sing for joy. Let us worship God. We invite you to follow along with the hymn For the Beauty of the Earth as Jacqueline plays it on the piano. you will find in the printed order. Gracious God, we, your hopeful people, wait now before you. We would be still. We would listen for your word speaking in our hearts. Instruct, inspire, and reform us. We pray by the moving of your spirit that we might worship you with gladness and follow your way with zest. Reclaim that which we have caused to go awry, rescue that which we have put out of place, forgive that which is amiss, and set us again to our ministries with passionate faith. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Let us rejoice in God's goodness, God's presence, God's hope, as we listen to the song of praise. Sunday of Lent comes from the Gospel of John this year. It tells the story of Jesus healing someone, a man born blind, and it tells the story of not only the healing, but of all the conversation that goes on around that healing, both before and after, from the man, with the man, from with his parents, with the religious leaders, with the disciples, all trying to figure out how is this healing happen? And why is, it being, why is it happening? But Jesus catches the chase, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Here's the story from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of John, verses 1 to 9. As he walked along, Jesus saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered them, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's work might be revealed in him. We must work the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. Then the man went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. Word of God, word of life. 
Please join me in a time of prayer. Open us, we pray, O Lord, in heart, soul, and mind, and let this ancient story go deep into our hearts. Let it speak to us in our time, but even more, let it be empowered by your Spirit, that it might give us new life, that it might transform our lives, and give us the guidance, hope, and courage we need in this time. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Anne Vanderlei is the Dean of Academics at Goshen Mennonite College in Indiana. Prior to her being a dean, she was a professor of public health at the school. And in a reflection that she wrote a few days ago, having to do with this particular story, she said that the real miracle wasn't so much that the man who had been born blind was able to see. The real miracle was that he did what Jesus told him to do. <laughs> I thought that was incredibly appropriate for our particular time. Jesus says to the man, go, go to the pool of Siloam, wash yourself, and then come back. And according to Anne, the man didn't bargain, he didn't argue, he didn't say, why should I go there? Shouldn't I have somebody go with me? All the kinds of things we might say when we've been told to, for example, wash our hands. But instead, he goes. He goes. And that, for Anne Vanderlei, is a real miracle. This is a perfect story for our time, this story from 2,000 years ago. A perfect story in that it tells of, it raises all kinds of questions about healing, about sickness, and about how we live, not just as they lived 2,000 years ago, but how we live here and now, March 22nd, in the year of our Lord, 2020. The story begins with a theological question. Actually, it begins even before that. The story begins with Jesus seeing the man. He's walking along and he sees someone who has been blind since birth. That's not what the disciples see. The disciples see a theological question. They ask the question not, can you heal him? Not, can you make him whole? But instead, they ask Jesus, who sinned? <laughs> who sinned? Their focus is on blaming somebody for this man's condition. But what does Jesus say? He says, no, this man was born blind not because of the parent's sin or because of the man's sin. Nothing original about that. People sometimes get born blind. Sometimes bad things happen, and it's not anybody's fault. It's not because of some kind of innate fallenness in the man or in his parents. Sometimes bad things just happen. I think that's important to remember in this story and in our time. Because there are a lot of things happening right now. There are a lot of things happening. And Jesus would have been the first person to have held people responsible for their actions in the situation that we're currently in. He was the first person, time and again, to remind the religious leaders, the political leaders, and the people as a whole that they were called by God to take care of the poor and the sick and those on the margins. He held people accountable. We're held accountable for our actions. But this story, this story makes it very clear from the very beginning it wasn't any particular action on anybody's part as to why this man was born blind. It just happened. Now, Jesus goes on and says in this particular passage that 
The man was born blind in order for God's work to be revealed through him. I have to admit, I have a lot of problems with that particular line. And in no other place, no other healing story in the whole, all of the Gospels is that statement made, that something tragic happened so that God could show forth God's good works or God's glory. No, that's not where Jesus goes when he comes to healing. And I have a real issue with this particular line from John's Gospel. Because in my estimation, it makes God into a narcissist who wants to make this man blind in order to show God's own glory. Or it makes God into an abusive parent who wants to teach this man or his parents or somebody a lesson. And so it makes a tragic thing happen. And I don't know about you, but that's not a kind of God I want to worship. It's not the God I am going to give my life to. So what do we do with that particular theological statement in that one sentence from the Gospel of John? Well, I have to say, I'm not sure what we do with it. What I do with it is to simply say, this is one place where I disagree with John, John's Gospel fundamentally. And to be honest, there are a lot of places in John's Gospel that I disagree fundamentally, but that's topic for other sermons. So what do we do with this whole story? Well, I think what we could do is compare this particular healing story with all the other times, all the other stories, not only in John's Gospel, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, of Jesus healing someone. Because the Gospels are filled with such stories. He heals people with unclean spirits, troubled spirits. He heals people who are deaf, who are blind, who are lame who have leprosy. And in no other story is this link made between the person's condition and God's glory or God's work, God's manifestation. No, Jesus doesn't, Jesus simply sees people who are, who are hurting and who are in pain and suffering, either mentally or physically or both. And what does he do? He reaches out with compassion, with care, with love, and with healing. He doesn't shrink back in fright. He doesn't condemn the person who is, who is experiencing the affliction. Instead, he heals the affliction. That's something for us to think about. Because the story of the man born blind and all the other healing stories are more than ever pertinent for us now. As we try to figure out what we do in this time. And I would say we do what Jesus did. And by that I do not mean that you spit on the ground and then rub mud on somebody. <laughs> But even in this time of social distancing, very important social distancing, what do we do? To do what Jesus did, we show compassion, we show love, we show hope, we offer healing, even at a distance. Yes, in some stories, Jesus physically touches the person with the affliction. But in other stories, he shows that compassion, that love, and offers that healing of body and spirit from a distance. The very first story of any healing that he performs from the Gospel of Mark, first chapter, the man with an unclean spirit, which is a, a way, a first century way of talking about someone who was afflicted with either a mental or a spiritual illness. The man shows up in the synagogue, and Jesus, Jesus from a distance, calls out that spirit and shows compassion for the man. And in Luke's gospel, when the centurion comes to Jesus to heal his servant, Jesus doesn't even go into the house 
he is still out on the road when the man, when the servant is healed. Compassion, care, love, courage. We can show all those things, be all those things, even from a distance. These are powerful stories, powerful stories, not only from 2,000 years ago, but also for us here and now, about how we live in such a time, how it is we regard those persons who are afflicted and will be afflicted with this pandemic. And Jesus makes it very, very clear that from the get-go, the response is compassion, care, love that crosses all distances. He saw the man, he saw his need, and he reached out. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul in his letter to the United Church of Ephesus wrote to that or encouraged that early that group of early Christians to keep the faith by seeing with the eyes of the heart. See with the eyes of your heart, he said. I think that's what Jesus did. When everybody else saw sin, brokenness, a beggar, confusion, Jesus saw a human being on the margins who needed compassion, care, love. And may we see that in our time, too. May we see with the eyes of our hearts, now and in all the time to come. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. You whose grace never ceases to amaze, you who continually opens our eyes to the world around us and opens our heart to your people, you who promises to be with us 
in good times and in hard times. You in whom there is more healing than brokenness in us. More light in you than shadows in us. More life in you than death in us. We come into your presence this day, O Lord, even more deeply. We come for your healing. We come for your hope. We pray not only for ourselves, but for this world that you so love. And as we enter into this time of prayer, help us first and foremost simply to remember how it is you have been present to us and with us in the past. Help us to remember how it is you have healed us in body or soul or spirit. Help us to remember those who have been agents of your healing power. Those also who have opened our eyes to you and to your world. Those people who have opened our hearts to your people. And those who have opened our minds to your future. And so as we come together in this time of prayer, help us simply to remember how it is you have already been present with your healing power in our lives and help us to give thanks. And out of those remembrances, then give us the courage to share our lives with you once again. Before we offer prayers for others, give us the courage to trust you with our lives and our needs. Because we come to you with our need for your wisdom, for your courage, for your hope. And so hear our prayers for ourselves in this time. And as you call those disciples out of loneliness and into life together, so too you call us out of the loneliness of our own lives. And even though we may be separated by physical distance, help us to trust that it is your spirit that continues to unite us and draw us together. And so we also lift to you, O Lord, the names of those persons whom we hold in the depths of our hearts people with whom we share life in this community of faith, people with whom we share our lives in the communities of friends and family, colleagues and co-workers. And we lift to you silently or loud the names of those persons in particular need in this time, of parents and children trying to find a new way in this new time, of those who are in fact conflicted in body or soul or mind, and those who love them and care for them. We lift to you the names of those who walk through the valleys of the shadows and those who walk with them. We lift to you, O oh Lord, the names of those with whom we share life even at a distance here and now. And we pray your healing power and presence.
And as Jesus continually turned his disciples to the world around them and to the needs of those whom they did not even know, so too you ask us to expand our vision and expand our hearts to embrace your whole human family. And so we also lift up to you, spoken or unspoken, the names of those peoples and places in need of our prayers, our love, and our commitment in this time. We pray for all of those persons who are on the front lines of this pandemic, for medical and hospital workers, for first responders, for teachers, for parents, for people who work in nursing homes, in jails and prisons. Help them to know that you are with them, giving them strength, giving them hope. We pray for research scientists and all who are seeking an end to this scourge, that they might trust your wisdom and guidance. We pray for our leaders to be honest with us about the depth and height and breadth of this situation. And we pray that, like Jesus, they might have compassion on all your people and for all your people, and that we might too. We pray for refugees and immigrants, those in along borders of countries, and those in prisons and detention homes, detention centers. And we pray that for those responsible for the decisions that affect their lives and our life. And so hear our prayers, O Lord, silent or spoken for this whole world. And finally, Lord, hear our prayers once again of thanks. Of thanks for your presence, even in this time, especially in this time. Of thanks for stories that remind us to open our hearts and our eyes, to see your people and to see your world, to open our hearts and our ears to hear the cries and hopes of our brothers and sisters. to open our whole lives to you, to your love, to your strength, to your courage. For we need all of that in this time and in the time to come. And open us, we pray, O oh Lord, to the ways shown us by Jesus the Christ, who showed us your ways of love and justice, who showed us how your love overcomes division, your love overcomes fear, your love overcomes even death itself. For it is in the name of the risen Christ that we offer our lives and our prayers to you, speaking to you with boldness, courage, and most of all trust the prayer that he has taught us. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Years ago, in times of hardship and tragedy, our African-American sisters and brothers sang their souls. They sang of the light that shines in the darkness of the darkness has never overcome. And so as we bring this service to a close, may that song also sing in our hearts and give us the commitment, courage, and the hope we need in this time and all time.
Here at United, we generally close with a benediction, the first line of which is, go out into the world in peace. <laughs> Today we're going to change that. And now, my brothers and sisters, I bid you be in this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all persons. Honor all creation. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with us all. May you be in peace. Amen. No. Uh -huh.